back to chapter four. The rest of chapter four is on circular motion, motion around a circular pathway. And we're gonna start with uniform circular motion, which is motion around a circular pathway at a constant speed. So we have a two-dimensional motion confined to a circular pathway. So think about um, a car on a Ferris wheel or um, taking a rock and tying it to the end of a rope and swinging it over your head, okay? Circular motion. Now, describing circular motion is quite different from describing other two-dimensional motions like projectile motion because the direction of the velocity vector is constantly changing and therefore using x and y as our positions and our vx and dy as our velocities in a Cartesian coordinate system doesn't make a whole lot of sense, okay? Also the direction of the acceleration vector continuously changes. So Cartesian coordinate system is out. We're going to have to use a different method to describe our motion. So we got to define some new terms. Our first one is period. Period is the time it takes to make one complete trip around the circle. Since period is a time, it's going to be measured in seconds. Okay? The distance around any circle, r, of radius r, is 2 pi r. Therefore, the speed for uniform circular motion, where we're moving around the circle at a constant speed, is just the circumference divided by the period. So speed is equal to 2 pi r over t. Now, how are we going to express where an object is on a circular pathway? We're not going to be using the Cartesian coordinate system because it's not useful. So we're going to use two different ways to express position. We're either going to talk about arc length, and for arc position or arc length, we're going to use the symbol S, or we're going to talk about angular position, theta, measured from the plus X axis. Okay, guys, so let's look at this image. Okay, so if we started out here and we've traveled to this location, we've moved through an arc length S. Or if we consider this our zero position and we're at this position, then we're at a distance S along the arc. And that corresponds to an angle theta that has been swept out. So as the arc length gets bigger, theta gets bigger. Now, in a Cartesian coordinate system, we're used to this being zero, y, the plus y axis being 90, the minus x axis being 180, the minus y axis being 270, and then sweeping back around 360 degrees. So I want you to remember that the positive direction when we're talking about circular motion is counterclockwise. The negative direction is clockwise, okay? When we get near the end of the semester and we're talking about torque, you'll understand why counterclockwise is a positive and clockwise is a negative. But for right now, you're just going to have to believe me. Okay, so let's scroll up. Now, there is a relationship between S, the arc length, and theta, the angle swept out, okay? Turns out that theta, the angle, is equal to S divided by R if the angle is being measured in radians. Okay, so we can say S, the R length, is equal to theta times R, the radial distance or the radius of the circle. Now, let's talk about radians for a minute. If I look at the unit radians, okay, think about theta. When I'm calculating the angle theta and I take S divided by R, arc length divided by radius, arc length is measured in meters, radius is measured in meters. When I take meters and divide it by meters, the units cancel out. So truthfully, this has no units. Okay, it's unitless. Radians is a made up unit. It has no physical reality. 
but it's there to help remind us that we're dealing with an angle, okay? So sometimes when we're doing calculations, especially later on in the semester, radians will kind of pop in and pop out of equations, kind of like magic, and it's because it's not a real unit, okay? So we think about one complete trip around the circle, S, the arc length for that is equal to 2 pi r, okay? So one revolution, one complete trip around the circle is equal to 2 pi r over r, or 2 pi radians. So one complete revolution is 2 pi radians. So let's look at some relationships here. We know that one complete, circle, one complete trip around the circle can be called a revolution, okay? One complete trip around the circle constitutes 360 degrees. So here's some things to remember. Our angle in radians is equal to S divided by R. Our angle, our angle in radians is equal to an angle in degrees times 2 pi divided by 360. The angle in radians also equals the angle in revolutions divided by 2 pi over 1 revolution. So we have a way to relate SR and the angle in radians, the angle in radians to angle in degrees, angle in radians to angle expressed in revolutions, like one and a half revolutions or three revolutions. Okay. So let's think about an object traveling around a circle and we want to start talking about its motion. Okay. One of the things that we want to think about is its tangential velocity which is a velocity vector pointing along a line tangent to the circle about which the object is moving. Now let me draw a pretty picture. Or a not so pretty picture. If it's not so pretty, don't tell. Okay? So let me draw a circle here. Okay. I'm drawing it freehand. Okay? So there's the center of the circle. There's our distance R. Okay, there's our radial length. And if I were to draw, you know, the plus x-axis here, plus y-axis here. Okay, if I have an object right here. So, you know, we've swept out an, a, a, an S and there's our theta. We think about that point right there, there is a velocity. Okay. So if I were to look at the velocity at this point, the velocity vector is going to point along that tangent line, okay? This is always going to be a 90 degree angle. If I were to come over to a new location over here at some time later, so that, you know, I've swept out an angle S, I'll call it S prime, so that I have an angle theta prime. Okay, again, the velocity vector is going to be along that tangent line. Ooh. So, V prime in magnitude is going to equal V1 in magnitude for an object undergoing uniform circular motion. But notice they point in different directions. Okay? So the magnitude of those is going to be equal. And it would be equal to let's see. Well, we'll worry about that in a minute. But they're going to be equal to each other. Okay? Now, we could think of the velocity here, V1, which equals V prime, <coughs> which equals the velocity tangential. <coughs> v sub t is just equal to delta S. over delta t. Okay? If we're traveling in the counterclockwise direction, then delta s is going to be positive. V sub t, the tangential velocity, is going to be positive. 
Okay. <clears throat> now, let's look and see how tangential velocity and angular velocity relate to each other. Okay, back over here so we can look at the screen. Now, we know that there's a relationship between S and theta, the arc position and the angular position. We know that the angular position in radians is equal to S divided by R, so that we can say S arc position is equal to angular position times R. So S is arc position. If it's changing with time, then the angle theta, the angular position, is going to change with time. So we know that S final equals S initial V sub T delta T. So we can say that V sub T equals delta S over delta T. And if the change in position is equal to change in angular, the well, arc position is equal to change in angular position times R, then velocity tangential delta S delta T is equal to the derivative of R theta over delta T. If R is a constant, then we get R d theta dt. That's me. I got too close. Ah! I did a bad thing. Dang, thank you. Now, and then we get this R equals omega. Now, R equals omega, we've introduced a new symbol. Omega is called angular velocity, okay? And it's going to be positive if we're moving counterclockwise, negative if we're moving clockwise. Omega is change in angular position with time. So that's why it's our angular velocity. Okay, scroll down for me. So angular velocity is equal delta theta delta t. And because we're dealing with uniform circular motion, omega, like v sub t, is going to have a constant magnitude. Okay? This means that for uniform circular motion, we can say that the magnitude of omega, the angular speed, delta theta delta t, is equal to 2 pi over the period. The angular, I mean the tangential velocity in magnitude is 2 pi r over t. Okay? Now these are equations you're going to need on your note card and you're going to use. Now, if we want to think about them in terms of vectors, okay, remember that counterclockwise is our positive direction, clockwise is our negative direction. I know I keep hammering at this, but I want you to remember that we can refer to these as vectors because they've got a directionality, either counterclockwise or clockwise. So, this makes the rate at which an angle is being swept out related to how quickly the object is moving around the circular pathway. Okay, so let's look at problem 26 on page 106 in your textbook. So let me flip over to page 106. Okay, and we're going to look at problem 26. Now, let's hit the camera button over here. We're getting fancy. And we're going to look at the problem. Okay, it says the Earth's radius is about 4,000 miles. Kampala, the capital of Uganda, and Singapore are both nearly on the equator. The distance between them is 5,000 miles. The flight from, flight from Kampala to Singapore is 9 hours. What is the plane's angular velocity with respect to the Earth's surface? Give your answer in angles, angle per hour. Okay, so we're going to work this problem. Now, let's slide over. And let's start working this. Okay. Perfect. Hit uh, computer. Yeah. There. Now I'm going to draw a picture for you, and then we're going to 
work on. I won't draw quite as big a circle. Okay, so we're starting out here at uh, our first location, okay, Kampala, and we're going to fly 5,000 miles to Singapore. So Kampala to Singapore. And yes, I know I've given it way too much, but this S, well, I'm going to go the other way because I want to do it, go this way. S here is equal to 5,000 miles. Okay? We're told that the radius of the Earth, R, is 4,000 miles. Okay? And we're told that our delta T is 9 hours. And we're asked omega, which is delta theta, delta T. Okay? So that's kind of our, our layout drawing. So now let's look at how we're going to do this problem. Okay? So there's all of our information. So our delta S, our change in position, is 5,000 miles. R is 4,000 miles. Delta T is 9 hours. Well, V sub T is delta S over delta T, which is equal to omega squared, um, omega R. So V sub T is 5,000 miles divided by 9 hours, which is equal to 4,000 miles times omega, because R is the radius. So I get 0 0.139 radians per hour times 360 degrees over 2 pi radians gives me 7.96 degrees an hour because the problem asks us for it in units of degrees per hour. So there's radians per hour, there's degrees per hour. Okay, not a bad problem. Now, we know from our earlier discussions, if an object is traveling at a constant speed and changing direction, it has to be accelerating. So any object moving around a circular pathway must be accelerating even if it's traveling at a constant speed. Because remember, acceleration has two parts of it. A change in speed, a change in direction, or both. A change in speed and a change in direction. So what we're looking at here in uniform circular motion is a centripetal acceleration. Remember, centripetal means center-seeking. A centripetal acceleration always points in toward the center of the circular pathway. Okay? So if we look at this diagram, if we look at three different points, notice that the velocity vectors are all the same length, and the acceleration vectors are always pointing in toward the center. An acceleration vector that is perpendicular to a velocity vector only affects a change in the direction in which the object is changing. It will not change the speed for the object. So let's look at how we get the magnitude of the acceleration. Okay? Now, if we think about acceleration being delta V, delta T, if we look at two velocity vectors over a delta theta for, with a delta T that's very small, okay? what you notice is you'll start to get a delta V vector that's pointing in toward the center. Okay, let's scroll up a little bit. And it turns out, I'm not going to bore you with all the algebra, A sub R is always equal to V sub T squared over R or omega squared times R. So your angular acceleration depends on how fast the object is traveling around the circle. Now guys, this is important. The faster something is traveling around a circular pathway, the larger the radial acceleration has to be to turn it. And when we start talking about forces, that's going to mean the larger a force we're going to need to turn something that's following a circular pathway. Okay? So, everything we worked out, let's see, so we are traveling along a radial, let's see, as a kinematics. So we're dealing essentially with constant acceleration just like we did in chapter two. 
And all of the equations that we had for uniform, well, uniform acceleration for one dimensional motion, we can use here. Back at it. So, at this point, what we're going to do is look at some problems that deal with uniform circular motion and objects undergoing uniform circular motion. So the first problem we're going to look at is problem 27. Are you freezing to death? No. So let's hit, yeah, dot key. So let's look at problem 27. Okay, it's at the bottom of page 106. And it says an old fashioned single play vinyl record rotates on a turntable at 45 RPMs. What is the angular velocity in radians and what is the period of motion? Okay. All right, now let's work. grab my calculator because we're going to need it. So what we're told is essentially we're given the angular velocity and it's 45 revolutions per minute. RPM stands for revolutions per minute. And what we're asked in this problem is what is the angular velocity in radians per second? And then we're asked also, what is the period of motion? Okay, now we know that there are two pi radians for every one revolution. Okay, so if I take 45 times 2 times pi, that's 282.7 radians per minute. Okay, and it wanted it, did it want it in radians per minute or radians per second? Okay, I'm in radians per minute, I need radians per second. So there are, for every one minute, there are 60 seconds. So I divide by 60. And I get an answer here of 4.71 radians per second. Okay? Now, period is the time that it takes to make one complete revolution. So thinking about our equations, switch back over for me. Let's scroll up. Keep going. Keep going. We're going to have to go quite a bit up. So if we go to our relationship between omega and period, keep going, keep going. Omega is equal to 2 pi over t. So if omega equals 2 pi over t, then t, the period, is equal to 2 pi divided by omega, which is 2 pi, and that's in radians, divided by 4.71 radians per second. So if we do the work, 2 times pi divided by 4.71 gives us a period equal to 1.33 seconds. So a spot on the outer edge of that record would be moving, making one complete circle every 1.33 seconds. So let's go down and let's look at the next problem we want to try. Let's scroll up a little bit. Okay, we're going to try problem 65 at the end of the chapter. Okay. So if we look at problem 65, I like this one, hit the um, dot cam. 
So if we look at problem 65, it's on the top of page 109. It says a typical laboratory centrifuge. Well, let me show you the problem. Yeah, guys, there's a lot of moving parts here. It says the typical laboratory centrifuge rotates at 4,000 RPMs. The test tubes have to be placed into a centrifuge very carefully because of the very large accelerations. What is the acceleration at the end of the test tube that is 10 centimeters from the axis of rotation? And for comparison, what is the magnitude of the acceleration a test tube would experience if it's dropped from a height of one meter and stops in 1.0 milliseconds? Okay, let's hold it right there and I'm gonna write some stuff down and then we'll, we'll switch over. Okay guys, on this problem, we're asked to find AR the radial acceleration, okay? And then we're, but let's start with that F for the rotation. Now, we're told that our omega is gonna be 4,000 revolutions per minute. And we're told that R, our radius is, 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.100 meters, because remember your book does everything to three sig figs. Okay? Now, we know that our omega, well, a sub r, is equal omega squared times r, which is v sub t squared divided by r, okay? But we're interested in getting this, and we have this. Now, we're given the omega in terms of revolutions per minute. To plug into this equation, I need it in radians per second. So there's two pi radians for one revolution, and for every one minute, there is 60 seconds. So 4,000 times two times pi divided by 60 gives me 419 radians per second. So A sub R would be 419 radians per second squared times 0 0.100 meters. So that squared times 0 0.1 gives me 1.75 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 to the 4 meters per second squared. That's a fairly sizable acceleration. Okay, so I'm going to write that up here. A sub r equals 1.75 times 10 to the 4 meters per second squared. Now that was part one of the problem. Okay, the second part asks us to compare a test tube that is dropped. Okay, so in part two, we have V initial y is equal to zero. V final y, we're gonna to have to calculate. This is right before it hits, before it stops. And then, so I know that V final for a drop is going to equal V initial plus ay delta t, and the initial velocity was zero. Our acceleration is minus 9.80. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want to use that equation. I'm going to use v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2ay delta y. Because in this drop, we know we're dropping from a height 
from one meter. Okay, so if you think about it, I'm up here at y equals one meter. We're going down here to y final equals zero meters. Okay, the velocity here is zero. We're gonna get velocity just as it reaches the bottom. So V final squared is gonna equal zero plus two times the minus 9.80 meters per second squared times zero minus one meter. So 9.8 times two, take the square root of that because notice the negative and negative cancel out. So I get V final is 4.43 meters per second. Okay, that's the speed. as it reaches the bottom. Now, when it touches the floor, we're told that it stops in a millisecond. So once it reaches the floor, going for, you know, and having, I'm gonna blow this up really big. It comes in here with initial velocity of 4.43 meters per second. And when it stops, V equals zero, one times 10 to the minus three seconds have a passed. So acceleration being equal to delta V delta T, okay, and we're gonna be looking just at magnitude here. The magnitude of the acceleration to stop would be zero minus 4.43 meters per second divided by one times 10 to the minus three seconds. Take the absolute value of it. I get 4.43 times 10 to the three meters per second squared. Okay, so if we compare these two, notice the end of the test tube is experiencing a greater acceleration than the test tube that was dropped. We know if we drop a test tube, quite often they break. So they have to be loaded very carefully because of the forces, hint, hint, previews of coming attractions, that they're going to experience in that centrifuge. Okay, so there's another circular motion problem. Okay, now, the next thing we're going to look at is non-uniform circular motion to kind of wind out the chapter. Okay? So, non-uniform circular motion is motion around a circular pathway with a changing speed. So if you think about starting a drill and the drill having to go from not spinning to coming up to top speed. Um, that would be a non-uniform circular motion. Or um, a record player stopping. Um, your wheel on your car coming to a halt. Or coming from being still at a red light to coming up to your speed. Those would be examples of non-uniform circular motion. Okay. Now, if you have changing speed, not only do you have a centripetal acceleration, a center-seeking acceleration, but you have to have a tangential acceleration because the tangential velocity is changing. The angular velocity is changing. The magnitude of A, the acceleration, is AT, tangential, velocity, uh, tangential acceleration squared plus radial acceleration squared, and AT is dV, tangential over dt. So let's look at the equations that describe non-uniform motion. Okay, now, hint, they look just like the equations that we saw for angular, uh, for uniform acceleration in one dimension. Velocity tangential final equals velocity tangential initial at delta t. Arc position final has to equal arc position initial plus velocity tangential initial delta t plus one half a delta t squared. 
velocity final tangential squared equals velocity initial tangential squared plus 2AT delta S. Okay, scroll up. Now, this brings us to a new term. Angular acceleration, alpha, okay, the lowercase alpha, is equal to change in angular velocity with time. There's a relationship between tangential velocity and angular velocity because there's a relationship between tangential velocity and uh, uh, tangential acceleration and angular acceleration because there's a relationship between tangential velocity and angular velocity. Namely, it comes down to tangential acceleration equals r times alpha. And all the equations we could write in terms of arc length we can now write in terms of angular position. So angular position final equals angular position initial plus omega initial delta t plus one half alpha delta t squared. And omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. Okay? So note since tangential speed is constantly changing, the magnitude of the centripetal uh, acceleration is constantly changing. So Whenever you calculate the, tan, uh, the radial acceleration, it's for that specific moment in time. So we're going to look at three problems, and these three problems will kind of round out our experience here. Now, what was the first problem number? You're seeing it on the screen. You just tell me. 40. Okay, we're going to look at problem 40. Okay, 39, there it is. It says a 50 meter diameter merry-go-round is initially turning with a four second period. And I'm going to start writing some information over here. Don't panic if you don't see me. So period initial is four seconds. Okay? And um, it slows down and stops in 20 seconds. So delta T is 20 seconds and our tangential velocity final is zero. Okay, the question asks us before slowing what is this what is this child's speed on the rim of the merry-go-round? So A is asking us VT initial. And then part B of the problem says, how many revolutions does it take for the merry-go-round to make its final stop? Or essentially ask omega final. And we're gonna label omega initial to be zero. Okay, so let's slide over here and start working things. Okay, now. V sub t initial, we can calculate from the period. It's 2 pi r over t, the period. So we have 2 pi, and we were told that the radius, well, the diameter was 5 meters, so the radius has to be half, half that, 2.5 meters. So we have 2 pi times 2.50 meters over the period which is four seconds. So two times pi times 2.5 divided by four gives me a tangential velocity of 3.93 meters per second. Okay? Now, I want to know omega final. There's a couple of ways that we can do this. I can go from V sub t initial and V sub t final and figure out the arc length, okay? Or I can get, go from V sub t initial to, um, excuse me, that should be theta initial and theta final. I can go from I can go from V to T to omega initial and omega final. There's a couple of ways I can work this problem. 
I'm probably going to work it in arc length and then go from arc length to where we want to go. Okay. Now I need to get out. I need to get a sub t. The magnitude of a sub t is just going to be dvt dt. So I've got zero minus 3.93 meters per second divided by 20 seconds. So a sub t is going to be 0.93 divided by 20, a minus 0 0.197 meters per second squared. Okay, so let me kind of box over here. I know v sub t initial is 393, I mean 3.93 meters per second. A sub t, the vector, is going to be a minus 0 0.197 meters per second. It's negative because remember the tangential, I mean the acceleration to slow something down has to pop, point in the opposite direction than the object was going initially. And since I made the object spinning in the counterclockwise direction to begin with, the tangential acceleration would have to be in the clockwise direction. Now, S final, equals s initial plus v sub t delta t plus one half a sub t delta t squared. So s final is going to equal zero plus 3.93 meters per second times 20 seconds plus one half times a minus 0 0.9197 meters per second squared times 20 seconds squared. So 20 times 3.93. So I have zero plus 78.6 meters plus two, let's see, 20 squared times 0.197 times five, so I have a minus 39.4 meters. So that's a 39.2 meters as my S final. Okay, now I've got that, but I need theta. Theta final is going to equal S divided by R. So 39.2 meters divided by the radius, which was 2.50 meters, gives me 15.7, no units. Here's where radians just pops in. So 15.5 radians times one revolution for every two pi radians because it asks us for it in radians. So 15.7 divided by 2 divided by pi gives me 2.50 revolutions. So it's going to go around two and a half times getting to the stop spot. Okay? And there's another way to do it, but I'm just showing you one. 